Guests, friends, ladies and gentlemen, I am Alexis Chester Sign, your host for today. Before we begin, I would like to mention a set of house rules to facilitate an orderly and organized discussions in this virtual platform. First and foremost, please do mute your microphones while the speakers are presenting to avoid any audio interferences. Second, kindly utilize the chat box to input your comments or questions while the talk is ongoing. Towards the end of the session, we will request everyone to turn, our, to turn on their cameras so that we can take a group photo of the participants. At this juncture, allow me to acknowledge our distinguished guests and partners who are present and have made this event possible. First is our guest speaker who will be properly introduced later, our university president, Father Ruel Lero SBD, vice president for academic affairs, Father Ramil Madale SBD, Dean of College of Arts and Science and other deans, faculty and staff of HNU, especially our policy professors, head of HNU Marketing, and of course, the political science students of Holy Name University and other departments. Thank you, everyone, for being with us today. Now, for the statement of purpose, may I give you the president of the Association of the Nationalists and Democrats, the Organization of Political Science Students of Holy Name University, Mr. Milvan Ray Auza III. To our guest speaker, Ambassador Frank Simafranca, to the Dean of College of Arts and Sciences, Dr. Ramon Boloron, to the, to the Political Science Department Head, Professor Anne Mariquit Opus, to the Head of the HNU Marketing and Advertising, Ms. Vera Villosedo, to the professors, my classmates, ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. We all know there are a lot of happenings today in the world. It is even aired in the news where everyone can see it. Most of the aired news are happenings that can affect relationships between one nation, one nation and another. Sometimes we will be confused why such decisions are made. That's why being aware of the international relations is significant. The purpose of this webinar is for us to be informed and understand the purpose of the international relations. Having an adept knowledge of such will help us understand why such decisions and events affecting the international relations is happening. I really do hope that all of us will learn a lot and will participate in this webinar. May God bless us all and good afternoon. Thank you very much, Milvan. And now may I give you our class professor, 
Professor Anne-Marie Kip D. Opus, PhD, to introduce our very distinguished guest, Professor Opus. Thank you very much, Alexis. To our guests, of course, our university president, Sir uh, Father, and uh, Father, our uh, Dean of the College of Arts and Science Sciences, and our Vice uh, President for Academic Affairs. Because I'm introducing somebody who saw, you know, when I read his uh, resume, his curriculum vitae, and knowing him to be the person that he is, Yes, uh, I would really like to begin by saying I'm so proud of him, not so much on what he has become, but for what he remains to be after what he has become. He was born and raised in Baclayon, finished his elementary at uh, Holy Spirit School and his high school from the Divine Word College then, now Holy Name University. He took and earned a degree in economics, also at Divine Word College. He took a postgraduate course at the Development Academy of the Philippines, taking a course on trade promotion and marketing strategies, and finished a program in development economics at UP Diliman 1984. Ambassador Simafranca then took and graduated from the University of the East College of Law in 1989 and, of course, passed the bar examinations. Perhaps early on, His Excellency Simafranca had his eyes on a career in the consular service as he took the United Nations Fellowship Program on Disarmament in the year 2000 in Geneva and New York. Starting out class, okay, Starting out as a clerk and researcher at the Office of Economic Affairs of the DFA Home Office, he served in various positions until 2015 when he was appointed Assistant Secretary of the Office of Consular Affairs. Amongst Ambassador Simafraka's position are the following. He served as Vice Consul, Philippine Consulate General in Sydney, Australia, he was also third secretary and vice consul of the Philippine Embassy in Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia, and likewise in Jakarta, Indonesia. He's also be, he also became second secretary, first secretary, and minister of the Philippine Mission to the United Nations and other international organizations in Geneva, Switzerland. He also served as minister and consul general, charge affair of the Philippine Embassy in The Hague, the Netherlands, from the years 2009 to 2012. Adding up to that, he was Consul General of the Philippine Consulate General in Dubai of the United Arab Emirates. And likewise, he was Ambassador Designate of the Philippine Embassy in Athens, Greece in the year 2018. He also served as Dep Deputy Chief of Mission of the Philippine Embassy in London of the United Kingdom of Great Britain and Northern Ireland from the years 2018 to 2020. Ladies and gentlemen, the ambassador extraordinary and plenipotentiary to Hungary with concurrent jurisdiction over Romania, Serbia, Bulgaria, Bosnia and Herzegovina, Moldova and Montenegro from 2020 up to the present. It is my distinct honor and privilege to give you His Excellency Frank Reville Simafranca. A big round of applause, please. Magang salamat, Kit, Professor Kit, for that uh, generous uh, introduction. Uh, well, mayong hapon kaninyong tanan. He has. First of all, I would like to thank uh, Dean uh, Boloron and uh, Professor Kit uh, Derikito Opus for inviting me to this uh, virtual forum uh, on international relations. Uh, I would also like to uh, greet uh, all of you, all of us, a happy uh, 75th, 75th anniversary uh, this year of uh, Holy Name University. Although uh, uh, when I was, uh, still studying, it was uh, Divine Word College of Tagbilaran at the time. So as uh, Kit has said, uh, I am a proud product of the SBD community. Even up to now, even up to now, I still uh, take pride of being 
a product of uh, the SBD community. Because from kindergarten up to uh, high school and college, you know, I was, uh, you know, educated, formed by the SBDs. No? From kindergarten to uh, grade six, no? elementary, I spent at the Holy Spirit School. No? It was then the College of the Holy Spirit. Pero naabot na abtan pa nako tong Saint Joseph College. No? I think I was. Uh, I was in a kindergarten up to grade one or grade two when uh, the name was, uh, when the school was renamed, it's College of the Holy Spirit. And uh, high school, uh, briefly, I spent uh, a year at the Immaculate Heart of Mary Seminary, but eventually uh, transferred to Divine Word College where I finished uh, my high school. And uh, also briefly, I studied engineering at the University of Bohol. And then, uh, balik, balik Japan sa Divine Word College to finish my, my undergraduate course in economics. No? So, uh, always, uh, uh, mubalik yun ta sa atong uh, ano, gigikanan, no? sa alma mater na to, which is the, uh, now the uh, Holy Name University. So today, uh, well, the uh, seminar, or this uh, forum uh, has a, a theme, no? unity in diversity, which is very, very uh, appropriate no? uh, in a seminar like this, international relations. But then uh, this theme is uh, probably I encountered this uh, several times no? in, my, in my career in the diplomatic service. No? Uh, I think this theme was adopted by the United Nations uh, some time ago. Uh, and also uh, when I was assigned in Australia, uh, this was also adopted by you know, the Australian government uh, to highlight the uh, multiculturalism of Australian society. Uh, so also with Philippine society. Philippine society is also uh, uh, diverse. No? We are uh, composed of several islands, several regions with different languages uh, and different cultures. No? And uh, this is what we are. You know? We are a diverse nation. So we cannot uh, you know, say that we are Filipinos by leaving out uh, you know, the uh, other parts of the country, like for instance, in the South. No? We cannot say that we are Filipinos if uh, you know, we leave out our Muslim brothers, for instance, you know, in Mindanao, because they are very much a part of our uh, identity as Filipinos. So uh, I think uh, Kate was also uh, asking me you know, uh, to uh, talk about uh, uh, Philippine uh, diplomacy and uh, Philippine diplomatic uh, practices. You know? Well, it's a very, very broad uh, topic. To, uh, but let, let me just, uh, you know, uh, say that, uh, you know, diplomacy is uh, broadly defined as uh, a tact, a skill, you know, in dealing with people, you know. Yeah, that's why uh, uh, if, uh, you know, you talk to a person uh, and say, uh, ayus pa, e, ayusin mo na yung, uh, ano, you gamitin mo ng gamitan o diplomasya. No? So, you mean to say, uh, you know, you, you try to, uh, to settle things, no? to settle things and avoid hostility or violence no? and settle a, a, a problem or controversy. It is also defined as uh, the art and science of maintaining peaceful relationships between nations, groups, or individuals. No? I think uh, uh, in your studies in political science, uh, uh, you would encounter this uh, type of definition. Uh, in the international scene, it is simply the conduct of relations between nations and international uh, entities. Well, it is also uh, referred to as the art or science of conducting international relations, such as in negotiating alliances, and uh, concluding treaties and agreements. No? But uh, diplomacy should not be confused with foreign policy. Uh, 
uh, those are two different uh, things now. Because diplomacy, although it is uh, uh, an instrument of foreign policy, is not the only instrument. Now. Although it is uh, primarily uh, an instrument, uh, the chief instrument of foreign policy. And foreign policy is uh, uh, set, normally set by our political leaders. Now. So foreign policy is regarded as an extension of domestic policy of a state. No? Uh, it establishes goals, no? the goals and aspirations of the people. Uh, it prescribes strategies and sets the means or tactics to be used for the accomplishment of such goals. No? So it could mean the employment of you know, uh, such tactics as uh, spionage nudge, although, although uh, uh, diplomats are, you know, what you call legal spies, no? because uh, we do things in a legal, in a legal way. Uh, uh, you can, an, a state may also employ uh, uh, extreme, you know, measures such as subversion no? or war and other forms of violence. But uh, nowadays, uh, especially with the United Nations, the establishment of the United Nations. Uh, war is uh, no longer the, you know, the mode of settling disputes. So that's why diplomacy is now at the forefront of uh, relations between states or countries. So uh, diplomacy actually is, uh, one of the oldest professions. No? Well, uh, they say that prostitution is the oldest profession, but I think it's diplomacy. <laughs> it's diplomacy. Uh, you know, uh, it is as old as civilization itself. In fact, uh, uh, I would say that, uh, you know, in the Bible, uh, it was already there. No? I think uh, the, the uh, first diplomat was the serpent the serpent who tempted Adam and Eve you know, to partake of the forbidden fruit. You know. So, uh, you know, the serpent employed uh, diplomacy, you know, uh, diplomatic tactics to entice uh, Eve to eat of the forbidden fruit. And uh, even in the, in the Bible, uh, you would see, uh, you know, a lot of... Uh, uh, so-called messengers, messengers from God. No? Uh, it could be the divine messengers like angels no? and uh, human messengers like the prophets. No? So the, they were the early diplomats. No? Yeah, that's why uh, diplomats, a diplomat you know, in, uh, in uh, Philippine uh, language, in Filipino, no? is sugo. Sugo, messenger, you know? because that is, uh, that's how, you know, uh, diplomacy really evolved. No? Uh, the, the early diplomats were mere messengers. Kaya ako, sugo lang ko. I, I am just a messenger, actually. <laughs> As an ambassador, I'm a messenger, you know, of uh, our uh, president, no? Uh, being the personal representative of the president uh, in this uh, country. So, uh, yeah, yun yung, uh, kwan, no? that, that is the uh, kwan of uh, diplomacy. And, uh, well, there are, of course, technical meanings, no? like uh, diplo. Diplo uh, is, means, uh, you know, folded. You know? And ma is uh, something, an object that is being folded because uh, the early diplomats carried letters, no? letters from their sovereign, from their king no? to another sovereign. So yun yung gan. And uh, those letters served as a pass no? for them to travel safely you know, from uh, across, uh, across borders, no? from one kingdom to another. But uh, of course, uh, you know, itong, uh, the, the uh, work of a diplomat, especially in, in uh, the early days, no, uh, was, 
was uh, sometimes uh, dangerous. No? It was fraught with dangers. No? Aside from uh, you know, uh, the dangers of traveling, at the time they had to travel long distances and along the way, uh, you know, uh, they could face uh, you know, hostile forces. You know? So, uh, and uh, at the same time, uh, when the message is not uh, you know, uh, uh, taken well by the, the king or sovereign uh, receiving the letter, sometimes it could uh, mean death you know, to the diplomat. So if you remember, you remember if you recall the movie, uh, what was it? Movie Three Hundred, wherein the Persian, you know, the Persian king, uh, Xerxes, uh, sent emissaries to to Sparta, no? to King Leonidas, no? and uh, presented, uh, you know, the uh, message no? or demands of uh, King Xerxes of Persia. So, siempre, the demands were very, well, na insulto si, kuan, si King Unidas of Sparta. So, because of that, he swiftly cut off the head of the emissary. No? So, so, that's, that's the, the job of a diplomat uh, during those times. No? Uh, but then, uh, it evolved through the years, especially during the Middle Ages, so that uh, diplomats were uh, becoming well respected. No? So they were uh, given immunities, no? immunities and privileges. So that's, that's how, uh, how the uh, immunities and privileges of uh, diplomats uh, came into being no? under the uh, 1961 Vienna Convention on uh, uh, diplomatic relations. So that is the, the con international convention that governs uh, the establishment of uh, diplomatic missions, no? embassies. And there's also a, a, uh, a separate convention that uh, uh, governs the establishment of uh, consular, no? consular missions. So mga consulates naman, no? consulates. But uh, the diplomatic, uh, the international convention on diplomatic relations is uh, has a much higher uh, status, no? uh, because uh, diplomatic immunities and privileges are are uh, of a higher, you know, level. So, uh, like for instance, you uh, a diplomat cannot be subject to uh, the jurisdiction, criminal jurisdiction of a state, no? so. If we commit a crime, for instance, uh, in in the country where we are assigned or accredited to, then we are immune. No? We cannot be, we cannot even be arrested. No? If we are arrested, we cannot be prosecuted because uh, we enjoy diplomatic immunity. But that does not mean that uh, you know you can, you will, you know, you can abuse. No? Uh, you're free to abuse that uh, immunity. No. Of course not, because under the same uh, convention, uh, we diplomats are obliged to respect the laws of the host country. So at all times, we have to respect the laws of the host country. And uh, aside from that, uh, the uh, sending country, like in, in my case, the Philippines, can also waive, no? it can also waive my uh, immunity. Such as when uh, you know when uh, you have committed a, really a heinous crime no? that is very, very disgraceful or embarrassing to the country, then uh, the country, you know, the government can uh, waive my immunity, and uh, once it is waived, then I can be uh, prosecuted for any crime uh, I would uh, I would commit. So uh, this is how you know diplomacy uh, uh, evolved, no? and uh, in the Philippines, uh, well, uh, diplomacy, I would say that uh, it probably started uh, long, long before uh, the Hispanic, uh, you know, period, because we know very well that our very own uh, Datu Sikatuna, no, uh, in in our history. Uh, 
uh, it, uh, he was the first to uh, forge a treaty of friendship you know, with, the, with the foreign power. You know? So the, blood, the famous uh, blood compact between uh, Dato Sikatuna and uh, Governor uh, de Gaspi. You know? So uh, that's why uh, in, in uh, Philippine uh, diplomacy, uh, the Order of Sikatuna is uh, the highest award that can be given to uh, both uh, Filipino and foreign uh, diplomats. So uh, the Order of Sikatuna with the rank of Datu, because you know, it's uh, the Order of Sikatuna with different levels. There is Datu, there is, uh, I think, uh, Kamanong or something. Uh, Basta yung kanan, may, may, may mga uh, levels. So, uh, but I would like to think that even before, you know, uh, the blood compact, diplomacy was already exercised no, by early Filipinos. Because uh, we have been in contact with the uh, foreigners, no, especially the traders no, from China, from, from other uh, parts of the uh, of Asia at the time. And uh, of course, we, we also learn from our history about the, well, it's more of a legend, no? like the, the, uh, uh, the sale of, you know, land to uh, Indonesian, you know, Indonesian migrants by the uh, indigenous people of uh, Panay you know, at the time, you know, the famous, uh, Marikudo, no? the, uh, I think it was exchanged, the, the land was exchanged for a golden salakot or something. So, but uh, th this is not, uh, you know, uh, this is more of a legend no? than uh, anything else. No? But uh, in any case, uh, you know, if indeed, uh, you know, it happened, no? of course, it can be considered as, uh, you know, the practice or exercise of diplomacy. Because they came up, you know, with an agreement. No? Uh, they came up uh, with an agreement to exchange. No? Uh, parang trade agreement yon, di ba? Uh, trade agreement for gold land in exchange for a golden salakot. No? <laughs> so, and uh, besides that, uh, Magellan, uh, so Magellan came in uh, 1521, di ba? Whereas uh, Ligaspi was in the late... Uh, uh, or sixteenth, uh, early sixteenth century, uh, fifteen seventy uh, something. So uh, Magellan came way ahead, no? and uh, he would not have uh, been able to, you know, to uh, uh, baptize Filipinos, for instance, in in Cebu, and uh, he would not have, uh, you know, fought fought uh, Lapu-Lapu in Mactan without entering into some sort of a, an alliance no, or agreement with uh, Raja Humabon. No? So the, the, uh, the story is that, uh, you know, is that uh, Magellan uh, tried to intervene, you know, in the uh, uh, rivalry between Humabon and Lapu-Lapu. Uh, and uh, to do that, he had to enter into some kind of a, an alliance with Humabon. No? So, so that, uh, you know, uh, they together, they can, uh, you know, they can uh, fight Lapu-Lapu. Uh, so uh, I would, I would uh, say that uh, earlier than Dato Sikatuna, <clears throat> there, was, there were already, you know, uh, uh, diplomatic, uh, exchanges no, uh, happening uh, in our country, especially in the area of uh, trade, no, in the area of trade and commerce. So, uh, but then uh, we were, of course, uh, after that colonized by Spain for more than 300 years. And uh, in uh, 1898, in uh, June 12, we gained our independence, no? and the first Philippine Republic was uh, 
was born under General Emilio Aguinaldo. So uh, with the birth of this uh, uh, new republic, of course, Aguinaldo organized his government. And among the first uh, department that was, uh, that was established was the Department of Foreign Affairs. I think it was established uh, 23 days, exactly 23 days after the you know, declaration of uh, Philippine independence in Kawit, Cavite. And the first uh, secretary uh, appointed by General Aguinaldo was uh, Apolinario Mabini, no? ang uh, dakilang, dakilang lumpo, no? the sublime paralytic. No? But uh, he was, he may have been a, a disabled person, PWD, but uh, he was, you know, very brilliant. He had a brilliant mind. In fact, uh, probably the most brilliant among uh, Aguinaldo's cabinet, uh, you know, uh, ministers or cabinet secretaries. So, but then uh, we know that uh, the first Philippine Republic was short-lived. You know? uh, the Americans came after the brief, uh, you know, uh, Spanish-American uh, War, and uh, they took over uh, the country. They disregarded the, uh, the independence that was declared by Aguinaldo, despite the fact that, uh, you know, uh, Aguinaldo sent uh, emissaries or envoys no, to Washington. Uh, it was uh, Ambassador Felipe Agoncillo no, who was sent to Washington. And then uh, Cayetano Arellano was sent to London and Paris. No. So to, to uh, try to, to gain recognition, because uh, these were the, well, France and uh, Great Britain were the uh, foremost uh, European powers at the time. And uh, the United States was an emerging power. And uh, they already had a foothold no? when, uh, when uh, Commodore Dewey uh, defeated the Spanish, uh, you know, naval armada in Manila Bay. So uh, General Dewey was anchored in Manila Bay. No? So uh, there was, uh, you know, they already gained a foothold. No? And uh, nevertheless, the Philippines, the, the uh, Philippine government then under Aguinaldo, uh, still tried no? to get the Americans to recognize our independence. No? But uh, that was not to be the case because uh, uh, the Americans had uh, other ambitions. No? Because they had no, among the European, the, the uh, Western powers, they were the only ones who did not have any, you know, any colony or any, uh, any foothold in Asia at the time. Although they also tried to, uh, to uh, gain some foothold in China. No? But uh, really, the Philippines was uh, the prized possession of the Americans. And they were able to gain it uh, you know, from, from Spain no? as a result of the Spanish-American War, in which the, the Americans defeated uh, Spain. And uh, by virtue of the Treaty of Paris, you know, uh, Spain ceded the Philippines no? uh, to the Americans for a price of uh, uh, 10 million, 10 million US dollars, I think, at the time. So that's uh, how, uh, you know, the Americans uh, gained the foothold uh, in the Philippines. But then the Filipinos, of course, uh, under uh, Aguinaldo, uh, at first resisted, no? but uh, the American forces were far superior in, in uh, firepower. No? That, uh, in uh, a matter of uh, two years, uh, they were able to suppress what they called the Philippine insurrection. Before they refused to, uh, to uh, recognize it as uh, the Philippine American War. Uh, so they just referred to it as the Philippine insurrection. 
Uh, and then, uh, of course, Aguinaldo, we knew, was captured. And uh, eventually, uh, the last of the uh, forces, no? Philippine uh, uh, forces, uh, surrendered no? uh, under General uh, Miguel Malbar no? in, in Batangas. No? But uh, in the other uh, parts of the country, uh, uh, some provinces uh, also, you know, uh, even with the capture of uh, General Aguinaldo, we, they continued the armed struggle against the Americans. And among the provinces was, of course, our beloved province of Bohol. Uh, I think uh, under Governor Reyes at the time. So uh, because of, uh, you know, this uh, resistance, you know, uh, against the Americans, uh, quite a number of Philippine towns, you know, were burned to the ground by the Americans, no? because they had this, uh, especially after the the summer uh, debacle, you know, the Americans, uh, they employed the tactic of uh, search and destroy, you know, wherein they talagang they raise, you know, the towns and villages to the ground, no? and. Uh, in fact, in summer, no, they, they tried to, say, uh, there was a general no, who said that uh, he's going to convert, you know, uh, summer into a howling wilderness, wherein, uh, you know, uh, everything moving would be, you know, would be killed. No? Anyone below 10 years of age, male, will be, you know, will be killed. So that was that was the the you know <laughs> the policy then you know to try to uh, terrorize you know the the population and uh, Bohol you know I think uh, there were a total of more than twenty uh, towns in Bohol that were raised to the ground you know? and many Boholanos uh, uh, er our early leaders in Bohol became uh, victims of uh, these atrocities you know, from uh, the Amer our American, uh, you know, American uh, occupiers. But uh, some of the, uh, our leaders, uh, fortunately were able to, you know, to uh, surrender and accept, you know, the, the Americans. I think uh, especially the, the early, the early uh, official, the leaders you know, of uh, uh, the towns uh, neighboring uh, Tagbilaran, uh, because Tagbilaran was the capital city, the seat of government, uh, pro the provincial government. And of course, the Americans uh, first occupied uh, the city. And uh, I think uh, one of the early towns that was occupied was uh, Baklayon. Uh, and uh, the uh, the town was uh, headed by uh, uh, mayor, uh, the namesake of uh, Professor Kit. No? I think uh, the mayor then was uh, Tomas Opus. No? Uh, well, uh, by the way, I, I am also from Baklayon. No? I uh, my mother hails from that, that town, and I was born in Baklayon, Bohol. No? And uh, you know, in Baklayon, uh, we, we have a closely knit uh, community there, wherein uh, almost every family are, uh, you know, interrelated. No? So the Opus and the Reveal uh, families, we are, uh, you know, closely related no? uh, because of the intermarriage, no? intermarriages. Like my, my uh, great grandfather, uh, his mother was. Uh, Opus, no? and also my great grandmother. Uh, my great grandmother was uh, also the mother was Opus. So talagang ngayon, magpinsan, minsan uh, magpinsan, uh, uh, they they intermarry. So uh, anyway, uh, yeah, the the mayor of Baklayon at the time, you know. Uh, were able to pacify the Americans. So the Americans spared uh, Baklayon. So I, I think there was a uh, story that uh, he was able to pacify the Americans when he offered them a tuba. No? <laughs> so 
and also uh, even uh, the towns uh, of Dawis you know, and Panglao. Uh, these were among the early, you know, uh, the towns that were uh, pacified. No? Uh, in fact, my my uh, grandparents, no? my grandparents, they were uh, products of the so-called Thomasites. No? So they were uh, educated by the early Americans no? because the Americans, among the good things that uh, they introduced uh, to the Philippines, was uh, universal education, no? elementary education. So every one, it was compulsory. No? Every Filipino at a certain age, no? uh, from I think seven years of age up to you know adolescence, they were required to attend uh, elementary school. So it was really compulsory. So my grandfather uh, was a Emiliano Simafranca was a supervisor at the time. No? He was a product of. Uh, the Philippine Normal you know, uh, College, now uh, Philippine Normal University. Uh, uh, it was then and now continues to be the uh, a premier, uh, premier uh, university for education, for training uh, you know, uh, teachers, for training teachers uh, in our country. Uh, also my grandmother, uh, my grandmother was a product also of the Thomasite. So they were both, my grandparents were both teachers. Uh, and then, uh, of course, my, my mother also was a school teacher. So uh, that's why I have very, very uh, high regard you know, and respect for teachers. You know, because, uh, of course, uh, they are the ones who really mold us. No? They are uh, the so-called bearers, you know, bearers of uh, the country's future. No? So now, uh, modern uh, Philippine diplomacy, as I've said, you know, uh, started with the first Philippine Republic, but then uh, during the American period. Uh, of course, uh, we were under, we were a commonwealth of the United States. So foreign relations at the time was handled by, by Washington. No? So we had no, we had no say when it comes to foreign, you know, foreign relations. Uh, that's why if you remember, uh, you know, I, I don't know if you have seen the movie uh, Quezon's Game, where in uh, Quezon, uh, in the late uh, 1930s or, or just before the start of the Second World War. Uh, welcome, Quezon, uh, welcome Jews to resettle in the Philippines. Because from Europe, they were already persecuted and many of them left, uh, left Germany, Austria, and other parts of Europe to resettle in uh, other countries. And they were not welcome. They were not welcome in the United States. The Americans refused to admit them, you know, in the U.S. and in in other countries also. They were they were refused entry. Uh, but uh, the Philippines under Quezon, you know, wanted to accommodate them. But since uh, uh, foreign relations was, uh, you know was uh, handled by the Americans. So there was a clash, you know, uh, the resident commissioner uh, of the United States, I think refused, no? refused to, uh, because, uh, you know, they have to get a visa, of course, to the Jews were, were, uh, were uh, required uh, to get a visa to be able to travel to the Philippines at the time. Mm -hmm. And the Americans initially refused. So uh, Quezon tried to make a, a, a political issue out of it. That eventually uh, the, the American resident commissioner relented and he allowed you know, uh, and uh, issued you know, 
authorized the issuance of visas to a lot of Jews no, in, in Europe to come to the Philippines. And uh, I think initially there were about uh, more than a thousand uh, Jews no, that uh, arrived in the Philippines at that time. And uh, we were prepared to, uh, to uh, admit even more, uh, but only it was uh, superseded no, uh, by the Second World War. So when Second World War broke out, uh, uh, it uh, you know this this, this uh, the flight of the Jews you know uh, as as we know uh, was stopped, you know? and instead uh, of uh, going elsewhere, many of them or most of them went to concentration camps. You know? uh, so uh, that is uh, the sad story of the of the Jews, you know? but uh, the Philippines has been uh, uh, very welcoming. Of the uh, Jews, and who knows, you know, if if uh, war did not broke out then, then uh, uh, we could have a lot of, uh, you know, uh, we have we could have a substantial Jewish population in, <laughs> in the Philippines uh, right now. And even up to now, you know, the the government of Israel, for instance, and uh, many uh, Jews are are grateful. Uh, of this uh, gesture that uh, we have shown to them, uh, the hospitality that uh, we extended to them, uh, especially at their time of need. You know? And uh, we did not only uh, extend that kind of hospitality uh, and uh, gesture of, uh, you know, of uh, compassion to the Jews, but also to even the white Russians, no? those who tried to escape, uh, you know, uh, communist rule in, in Russia. So there were a lot of uh, white Russians. Initially, they went to China, you know, they, they settled in China, but then uh, eventually they became, you know, uh, unwelcome in China. And then eventually, uh, resettled in the in the Philippines, many of them uh, resettled in Giwan, Samar. So for for a while, they, they reset, the white Russians uh, resettled in Giwan, Samar, until they were able to you know uh, to uh, finally resettle in other Western countries like the United States and Australia. But many of them uh, stayed on in the Philippines. Uh, one of the uh, descendants of uh, those white, white Russians, for instance, uh, was a famous uh, Philippine actor. But uh, I don't know if uh, some of you, especially the the uh, students, would still remember him. Uh, Ronald Remy, for instance, Ronald Remy. Ronald Remy was a descendant. The actor Ronald Reagan was a descendant of uh, the white Russian Jews, uh, uh, no, white Russians uh, who came to the Philippines. His name, his surname was Kokorichin. Kokorichin. So Ronald, Re but Ronald Reagan was his, uh, you know, uh, was his uh, screen name, screen name, and uh, the the uh, Jews who came, you know, welcomed by Quezon. Uh, among the descendants is the wife of our president. The wife of our president. See, uh, what, what's her surname? Uh, I forgot, <laughs> I forgot the surname, but uh, she is a, you know, a descendant of the Jews. And another one is a famous actor, famous actor, uh, the Eigenman. Yung mga Eigenman, sina, uh, sino ba yan? Yung, uh, yung actress na yun? Andy, Famous, Andy. Uh, Andy Eigenman. Yeah, Andy Eigenman. Yeah. But, but the father had a different sc screen name. Huh? Si Eddie, Eddie Mesa. Yeah. The, the grandfather of Andy Eigenman, Eddie Mesa, was a famous uh, actor in the 60s. No? was a surname uh, Eigenman. 
and uh, he he was a descendant of the uh, the Jews that uh, settled in the Philippines no? uh, prior to the second Second World War. So uh, finally, uh, the the Philippines, you know, after the the uh, Second World War in 1946 regain uh, its independence. No? Uh, we were granted independence with the Americans. And that was really the start of the real you know, organization of the, the uh, diplomatic service, no? the Department of Foreign Affairs of the Philippines. No? And the first uh, diplomats, our first diplomats were uh, trained by the Americans, no? by the Department of State. That's why uh, there is a book that was written by uh, recently by uh, a Filipino diplomat. Uh, his name is uh, Mark Borja. Although Borja, uh, but he's not. I think he's not uh, not from Bohol, but Borja from a different. You know, I, I I don't know which province he comes from, but anyway. He wrote uh, this book about the State Department boys. The State Department boys were uh, several batches of uh, Filipinos who uh, were trained by the uh, State Department, the US State Department in the art and science of diplomacy. Yeah. So uh, I think uh, up to now, uh, there, there are no longer any of the surviving uh, <laughs> surviving members of that group, no? the State Department boys. Uh, among the last the last uh, surviving uh, uh, member of that group uh, is, is the father of uh, one of our ambassadors now, our ambassador to the United Nations in Geneva. Uh, Evan Garcia, his father, uh, Ambassador Delpin Garcia, was uh, among the youngest of the uh, State Department boys. That's why he was uh, among the last uh, who who, uh, who passed away. And I even uh, during my stint as a vice consul in Sydney, uh, I even had a chance to meet uh, one of them. Uh, Ambassador, uh, ah, I forgot. Sometimes my my uh, memory escapes me. You know? I'm I'm uh, poor at remembering names. You know, uh, but anyway, uh, he he was uh, an ambassador, Philippine ambassador to Malaysia. Is that was his last uh, posting in Malaysia. So. Uh, after the State Department boys, then uh, of course, uh, the, the, the uh, Department of Foreign Affairs was organized uh, during the time of President Rojas, the first president of the second, uh, or no, the third, the third uh, Philippine Republic, because the first, Aguinaldo, the second was uh, the Republic under Japanese occupation under uh, Jose Laurel, and the third was, uh, uh, after we gained independence from the Americans. So it was uh, President Rojas at the time. So he issued the executive order uh, organizing the Department of Foreign Affairs of the Philippines. And then uh, uh, another law was enacted, you know, the Foreign Service Act, uh, in, 708, I think, uh, which really uh, became the Foreign Service, uh, the first uh, Foreign Service Act. And uh, among the the uh, the provisions of that act was uh, the institution of the Foreign Service uh, Officers Exam, uh, uh, authored by uh, the former Secretary Raul uh, Manglapus, uh, who was uh, Under Secretary at the time. Uh, was secretary under secretary at the time, and among the first uh, products of the foreign service exam, the first examinees, I think he was uh, in the second 
yeah, uh, you, in the second batch of the Foreign Service uh, Officers Examination was uh, a Boholano diplomat no? named Pablo Suarez, Pablo Rocha Suarez. So he was among the uh, first uh, uh, professional, professional uh, uh, Filipino diplomats who hurdled the Foreign Service uh, examinations. And then uh, after Pablo Suarez, uh, we uh, another uh, Bolano uh, also heard of the exam. Uh, his name was uh, Samson Sabalones, uh, coming from Pablo Suarez is from Tagbilaran. I say the mother is Rocha, so he came from Tagbilaran City. And uh, Samson Sabalones was from Hingutanan Island, Talibon Bohol. Hingutanan Island. Have you, is, is any one of you who been to Hingutanan Island? They say, well, I have not been there, but, uh, but uh, they say it's a very beautiful island. And imagine, you know, a small island, small island, you know, in a small islet uh, that forms part of uh, uh, Taliban has produced, you know, has produced an ambassador. Samson, in the name of Samson Sabalones. His last assignment was as ambassador, Philippine ambassador to Nigeria, to Abuja. He was also Philippine ambassador to, uh, to uh, Laos and a Philippine consul general to San, uh, in San Francisco, you know, among, among the, uh, you know, his posts of assignment. Uh, well, uh, Pablo Suarez became ambassador to Malaysia uh, also to China, and uh, his last assignment uh, uh, before he uh, uh, passed away was as Philippine ambassador to Washington D.C. But uh, there were also other Boholanos, you know, who uh, uh, who uh, were appointed, you know, uh, to ambassadorial ranks no? because at the time. Uh, as it is now, uh, the ambas ambassadors can be appointed by the president. So uh, during the time when uh, Garcia president was president, Carlos P. Garcia, our very own, uh, you know, Boholano president, uh, when he succeeded uh, Ramon Magsaysay, uh, he appointed uh, a Tagbilarano, no? a former mayor of Tagbilaran, I think. Uh, in the person of Jacinto Borja. So Jacinto Borja was appointed uh, Philippine ambassador to the United Nations in New York. So, so we've had, you know, several uh, Boholanos who, uh, you know, uh, Ambassador Suarez also became, you know, uh, undersecretary of foreign affairs you know, for, for quite some time. And uh, of course, the the, the Boholano that uh, occupied the highest uh, position in the Philippine Foreign Service was uh, our very own uh, President Carlos P. Garcia. Uh, he was sec Secretary of Foreign Affairs. He held the portfolio of Secretary of Foreign Affairs while uh, being a Vice President when he was a Vice President to uh, Magsaysay. So, because at that time, uh, especially if you, the president and vice president belong to the same party, you know, the, the uh, foreign affairs portfolio is a coveted portfolio. So the vice president will always, you know, like to occupy that portfolio. Uh, and then, uh, you know, the, uh, the, uh, Philippine, uh, you know, Philippine Foreign Service evolved you know, through the years, uh, especially during the time of uh, the time of Marcos. Well, we had, of course, martial law you know, during the time of Marcos, but at the time uh, we also tried to open up, you know, uh, open up to uh, 
the so-called Eastern Bloc, you know, the, the communist or former communist countries, mostly in Europe. And uh, of course, it also includes China. So uh, that's why in 1975, we opened up and uh, Marcos uh, visited China and then uh, Moscow, no? Russia, uh, when it was still the USSR, United uh, the Union of Soviet Socialist Republics. And then uh, in the mid 70s, we, uh, we established uh, diplomatic relations with some, you know, some uh, communist countries in Europe, no? like Romania, Romania, and then uh, the former Yugoslavia, uh, of which uh, now belongs yeah, belongs to, uh, uh, I mean, uh, are now under my jurisdiction because uh, Romania, I'm also ambassador to Romania and ambassador to Serbia, which is part of the former Yugoslavia and also Bosnia and Herzegovina. So uh, this opening up, of course, widened, you know, our, our work. So we had to also, uh, you know, uh, appoint uh, more, more people. So uh, that was uh, the time when uh, I joined the Philippine Foreign Service in 1981. In 1981, and I had the the, uh, the privilege and opportunity to serve under a a, uh, an eminent uh, Secretary of Foreign Affairs you know, in the person of uh, General Carlos P. Romulo, who is regarded as Mr. United Nations because uh, he was a signatory. He was one of the signatories of the United Nations Charter you know, and had the distinction of being the first Asian. He was the first Asian to be elected president of the United Nations General Assembly. Although the, the first Asian to become Secretary General, the United Nations was, if you remember, Utan, no? Secretary General Utan. He was a, a Burmese or Myanmar, Myanmar, uh, you know, Myanmar national. But uh, that was during the 60s. No? So uh, Philippine diplomacy really evolved uh, you know, very fast no? since uh, the 1980s no? because uh, we became uh, involved in, in a lot of uh, negotiations. No? Uh, and among those were the uh, trade negotiations, uh, which now uh, created the uh, World Trade Organization. Before it used to be uh, called the General Agreement on Tariffs and Trade, the GATT, uh, where in uh, several rounds of negotiations on, uh, you know, on uh, lowering tariffs and eliminating barriers of, uh, you know, uh, barriers uh, to trade were held. No? We had Tokyo rounds, the, the Buenos Aires rounds, uh, so many rounds. No? And now uh, I think uh, we're still in uh, the Doha round of negotiations. And it's a never ending you know, negotiation because it's very difficult, very difficult to really come up with you know, a consensus on uh, how to, uh, to uh, eliminate all barriers to trade or, or uh, to come up with you know, a free trade regime for all countries. You know? It's almost impossible. It's almost impossible. It's like uh, you know, disarmament. Disarmament, I, I was uh, handling uh, disarmament issues when I was assigned uh, at our uh, mission to the United Nations in Geneva from the year, year 2000 to 2006. And uh, I saw how difficult it was you know, to, to negotiate uh, disarmament uh, agreements or instruments. Until now, you know, the, the uh, uh, 
conference of uh, conference on disarmament cannot uh, even agree on a on a program you know on a program or a, an agenda you know for its meetings and it has been going on for years you know, going on for years so very very difficult sometimes uh, you know uh, because you know in in uh, in uh, trade and in disarmament uh, what is required is consensus you know? so everybody has to agree so if just one country will not agree then you will not have consensus you know? so uh, in consensus uh, you know in a regime of uh, consensus you have what we call the tyranny of the minority wherein the a country can even hold you hostage you know? hold the entire the entire uh, international community the entire world hostage so but of course uh, you know uh, if you are a small country you can easily be pressured you know, to to <laughs> to agree you, know? you can easily be pressured to agree or uh, not not really pressured but even enticed no? by just giving you some some kind of incentive no? you can be uh, persuaded no? or enticed to agree uh, to an international you know uh, international uh, convention or international regime no? so uh, that's how uh, philippine uh, diplomacy developed and then uh, during the post uh, edsa uh, post edsa years uh, the philippines also uh, underwent a major trans uh, the philippine foreign policy underwent a major transformation major change because uh, it added a third pillar you know a third pillar in uh, philippine foreign policy and that third pillar is now the protection protection of Filipino nationals no? and ensuring the welfare of Filipino nationals abroad. Before we, we were just, you know, uh, focused on uh, our uh, political and security relations with other countries no? and our economic, you know, uh, relations. So we had uh, political and security and economic diplomacy as uh, major pillars no? and uh, in the uh, mid 90s we added the third pillar during the the ramos administration and that was uh, that is now the protection of filipino nationals abroad and that was uh, uh, as a result of uh, as a result of the floor contemplation case you know, you know remember that uh, uh, filipina worker overseas filipino worker who uh, was handed down the death penalty in Singapore for uh, uh, committing the crime of uh, murder. So actually, uh, I was already in, in uh, Indonesia at the time when, when it happened. But uh, before it happened, the, the floor contemplation uh, case happened. I was handling a similar you know, case when I was uh, third secretary and vice consul in Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia. We had two cases uh, where uh, you know, the, the uh, Filipinos were in danger of uh, being meted the death penalty. Uh, one case uh, was really similar very similar to the floor contemplation case you know, wherein uh, the the filipina worker you know uh killed the, her uh, ward no, ward mga, mga nani sila, eh. they were they were nannies no? and uh, they were taking care of uh, uh, babies no? toddlers and uh, out of anger or frustration or whatever so they they were able to kill uh, their wards no? and uh, in the case of the Filipina in in Malaysia that I the case that I handled uh, 
we were able to, you know, to uh, get a good lawyer for her, uh, a very good Malaysian lawyer. And uh, uh, they, uh, of course, uh, they uh, put up the defense of uh, insanity. So at the time that you know she was she was uh, being maltreated by the grand grandmother no? and uh, napuno no yung mga yung pasensya niya uh, nawalan siya ng pasensya and uh, his anger doon sa bata no? na so that's why uh, and uh, we were able to successfully, you know, defend her. So she was declared uh, insane you know, by the court in Malaysia, and uh, was not meted, you know, that penalty. She was just, uh, you know, uh, uh, sent to a mental institution for a while, and I, I think uh, after a few years, uh, she was sent home you know, to the Philippines. The other case was, uh, it involved a, a Filipino fisherman, a very young uh, fisherman. She was, he was even underage, uh, but uh, he managed to get a Philippine passport, which shows that he was, I think, 18 or 20 years of age. And this Filipino fisherman uh, killed a, a fil fellow Filipino, you know, a crew member of the same fishing boat, because he was bullied. You know? He was bullied by that, uh, by, the, by the victim. So one time, uh, he uh, went out of his mind and uh, managed to uh, murder, you know, the, the bully. So uh, the entire crew of that vessel were, I think, uh, seven, eight of them, including the perpetrator. Uh, were, were in prison no, in, in uh, Penang. So I visited them in prison. I talked to them. And uh, eventually I, I uh, realized that, you know, that uh, the need, the need uh, really to plea bargain. So fortunately, uh, President, uh, Prime Minister Mahathir, you know, was about to visit uh, the Philippines. Uh, pay a, an official visit. And uh, I was able to persuade the uh, Malaysian uh, prosecutor's office to uh, downgrade, you know, the charges uh, from murder to um, manslaughter, manslaughter, uh, which do not carry the death penalty. Manslaughter is um, 12 years imprisonment. So there was a plea bargaining, but I, when I talked to the to the uh, uh, accused, I explained to him very clearly what it would entail. Of course, uh, he has to admit that he killed he killed the person, and uh, and uh, truly he admitted to me that uh, he committed the crime. So I told him that uh, you know for for the sake of your companions because they were also they were also uh, being held as remand prisoners the other the other filipino crew members of the fishing boat because they were to be of course presented as witnesses you know, uh, during the trial so uh, eventually he understood and uh, we managed as i've said to negotiate for a plea bargaining in our agreement and the uh, the uh, charges were reduced to manslaughter. Yeah, and then the, the, the accused uh, eventually was, uh, after five years of uh, serving his sentence, uh, the uh, sentence was suspended and he was uh, sent home to the Philippines. So uh, these were, you know, uh, some of our, our difficult uh, work in the foreign service. Uh, trying to uh, ensure the welfare and protect you know, the interest of our nationals abroad. But uh, as a pillar of Philippine foreign policy, there's no escape. I mean, uh, we have to do it. So uh, 
uh, the the uh, Ramos years also saw you know the the first time for the first time <clears throat> our our conflicts with China in the, the uh, in the West Philippine Sea. Uh, I was uh, also involved uh, personally, you know, because I was the uh, the head of the China desk. I was the director in charge of the China desk in the Department of Foreign Affairs during the time from 1997 to 2000. So uh, the incident, you know, the occupation, Chinese occupation of mischief reef was at the forefront of <laughs> our you know, conflict with China at the time. And we were involved in lots of uh, negotiations you know, with the Chinese. And in fact, uh, in one of the meetings was uh, the Chinese side was uh, was headed the delegation Chinese delegation was headed by no less than the current foreign minister, Mr. Wang Yi. You know, he was a tough negotiator, but uh, we stood our ground. We stood our ground. So, uh, and then uh, I uh, I was also assigned in in. Uh, in The Hague, and uh, if you remember during the uh, Aquino uh, administration in 2012, you know, another major incident uh, happened you know, in the West Philippine Sea in which uh, uh, the uh, Chinese uh, naval uh, Coast Guard vessels and the Philippine Navy were, uh, you know, were uh, facing each other you know, in Scarborough, Scarborough show. And uh, well, uh, the Chinese eventually were able to, you know, prevent uh, any Philippine ship, even fishing boats, from entering the shoal, even up to now. Yeah. And uh, in The Hague, I was tasked you know, to, to prepare, you know, the groundwork for the filing of uh, the famous uh, arbitration case uh, against China in uh, the West Philippine Sea. So uh, as a minister and consul general in The Hague, we, we uh, did our homework. Uh, we uh, supplied all the information that uh, the Department of Foreign Affairs uh, needed in order to, uh, you know, to mount a legal challenge against China. And then uh, during this uh, administration of President Duterte, uh, of course, uh, we have, there, there are many, uh, there are many uh, talks no, that, uh, that uh, we have been cuddling China and uh, uh, we are we are uh, you know trying to to uh, denigrate or uh, uh, setting aside you know, our claims you know uh, setting aside the arbitral the ruling or the award of the uh, arbitral tribunal but that is not true of course uh, well uh, the president you know uh, he has a lot of pronouncement so many. <laughs> so many rhetorics you know but uh, well i don't know uh, how it will affect our our uh, you know uh, the the arbitral award but uh, to my mind you know it's already there you know? i mean uh, it's it's not part of international law although china continues to uh, to reject reject the award and uh, uh, and uh, claim that it is invalid, but uh, for us it is a major uh, victory. It's a legal victory. Uh, and it is not just a legal victory for the Philippines, but uh, the entire uh, you know international community, because uh, the. South China Sea cannot be appropriated by one single state or country, no matter how, how big and powerful. 
the uh, South China Sea belongs to uh, to uh, humanity, to the entire uh, in, uh, humankind. So even the features, the features there, like uh, mischief free and the shoals that are now converted by China into artificial islands. These are part of the global commons, you know, which cannot be appropriated as territory by any country. Well, uh, a country can, under UNCLOS, a country can uh, uh, put up or establish artificial islands, but in accordance with the, the UN Convention on the Law of the Sea, in which uh, the one given the right to uh, put up artificial island, islands is the coastal state. So in the case of mischief reef and uh, some of the reefs, which falls well within our uh, EEZ, you know, or uh, exclusive economic zone of 200 nautical miles, uh, that is measured from our shorelines, we are the ones. You know? The Philippines is the coastal state that has the right to put up those islands. So in short, China is illegally, you know, uh, constructing those islands and occupying those islands, which belongs to the international community. If uh, there would be those islands, it should belong to the international community. Although, uh, you know, if it would be administered probably by the coastal state. So uh, these are among the complex issues that we deal with nowadays in, uh, uh, in uh, our uh, diplomacy or our diplomatic relations with not only China, but uh, other uh, countries as well, especially the claimant, other claimant states like Vietnam, Malaysia, uh, Malaysia, Brunei, and even, even Taiwan, yeah? even uh, which is a close neighbor. And uh, it also impacts on our relations with other neighbors like Japan, uh, Korea, even South Korea, and even Australia. Because, uh, you know, of course they have interests, you know. The freedom of navigation is crucial to uh, many of the states you know? because the South China Sea is a major line of uh, communication you know? and uh, trade and commerce, of course. Uh, Otherwise, uh, you know, you have to go through the Western Pacific, which would be a long journey going to Japan, for instance, from Europe. So uh, it's very important that, uh, you know, access to, uh, to uh, shipping lanes, you know, like the uh, Indian Ocean, the Straits of Malacca, and then the South China Sea, the West Philippine Sea. You know. uh, these are major lines of uh, uh, communication and uh, uh, major shipping lanes, which uh, no country should be allowed to control. No country should be allowed to control because it belongs to the international community, it belongs to the whole humankind. So uh, uh, my dear uh, students, uh, more or less, uh, that is uh, uh, the evolution of uh, Philippine diplomacy, and also uh, partly, you know, my experiences, you know, in in the foreign service. Uh, I've been in the foreign service for forty years now, and uh, I'm not getting young. So uh, maybe in a few years, I will be bowing out of the service but uh, always with the thought that uh, probably I have done something for my country. So maybe uh, uh, Professor Kitt, uh, I would uh, 
open the floor for you know a more interactive you know interactive uh, uh, forum so yes, uh, yes. maybe the students or anyone can uh, can uh, you know propound the questions yes they're interested yes very excited any, to ask questions yes question? yes yeah. uh, the mc please Thank you, His Excellency, for a very informative, insightful, and generous sharing this afternoon. As international relations students, we are deep, deeply appreciative of this learning experience. At this point, we shall have the open forum. May we have Ms. Crystal Kabahog, who shall be our moderator. Crystal, please. Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon, His Excellency. So. Before the start of the lecture, we have asked everyone to uh, share their questions through our Zoom chat box so that we can read these questions after the lecture of the ambassador. And true enough, my classmates here are very um, interested in the lecture that His Excellency have has rendered. So first off, uh, Mr. Ambassador, good afternoon. So there's a question from Mr. John Mark Paparon under the uh, class of Professor Opus, which is the International Relations class. So his question first is, the foreign service exam was dubbed by most pastors as considerably harder than the bar exam. What can you give as an advice to aspirants in order to pass the examination? Okay. Well, uh, I agree. You know, I agree uh, with that observation that uh, uh, it's, uh, it's a very hard exam. But whether it's uh, harder than the bar exam, uh, that's, that remains to be, you know, to be debated because I am also a lawyer, I also underwent the bar exam. And, uh, well, uh, honestly, I prepared, uh, you know, more for the bar exams than the <laughs> foreign service exam. Maybe because uh, uh, I was already in the uh, diplomatic, I was already in the DFA uh, for close to 10 years. I was working in the DFA for close to 10 years. Uh, you may consider me as a an accidental uh, diplomat because I was not really planning to uh, to uh, uh, establish a career, you know, in the foreign service. At the time, uh, I was more focused on becoming a lawyer, you know, and uh, becoming a lawyer, and. Uh, was thinking, in fact, of, uh, you know, of uh, going to law practice at that time. But then uh, I was persuaded by my former uh, superiors to take the exams, you know. And uh, that was uh, the time when I just passed the bar exam. You know? And uh, I was assigned to Sambuanga to head our uh, passport office in Sambuanga. And... Uh, well, uh, it gave me the incentive of, uh, you know, uh, being able to travel from Sambuanga to Cebu, you know, because I, I took the foreign service exam in Cebu and uh, also visit my family in Bohol you know, at the time. So it was, uh, it was more the, <laughs> the incentive of, uh, you know, being able to, to uh, travel you know, uh, at, at government expense. You know. So I, I never really, you know, seriously prepared for the foreign service uh, examination, but I was already well grounded, of course, because uh, even uh, as an ordinary uh, employee during my ten years at the time, ten years of uh, experience in in uh, in the DFA. Uh, we were already doing substantial work. We were preparing, uh, you know, draft, drafting uh, uh, agreements, uh, communiques, uh, diplomatic communications. I was, in fact, uh, I already wrote speeches, you know, for for the 
foreign minister at the time. I, when when uh, foreign minister Doy Laurel uh, visited Canada, I wrote his speech, uh, uh, the speech that he delivered before the Filipino community in, in Toronto. So uh, we were, you know, uh, we were already uh, well grounded and uh, uh, into into uh, you know serious uh, work uh, in in the DFA. So that's why that's why uh, probably uh, I did not need you know <laughs> uh, that uh, serious preparation. But uh, I I would uh, I would suggest that you really prepare because you know. Uh, the difference between the bar and the foreign service exam is in the bar, there is a specific uh, coverage, you know, a subject. So you have political law, you have, uh, you know, you have uh, commercial law, criminal law, taxation, and there is a specific coverage. You know? So, so uh, you know, you know what, what, what to study, you know. So you know what to study. Whereas in the foreign service exam, uh, you can be asked any question under the sun. Any question under the sun. Sometimes you will, uh, you know, you will uh, see, you know, ridiculous questions. You will encounter ridiculous questions, or you might consider it ridiculous, but uh, actually, uh, those are, you know, trick questions. Those are trick questions. Just to test, to test your agility, you know, your mental acuteness. Uh, sometimes uh, the examiners uh, do that. So uh, you will encounter that kind of question, and uh, you'd say, "What? What kind of question is this?" I mean, uh, you know, in the bar exams, uh, you, know, you cannot do that. You know? I remember. I think I don't know if uh, it was uh, one. Uh, famous uh, Filipino, uh, Claro M. Recto. He was a bar top nutcher. And uh, I heard that, uh, you know, he, he questioned, you know, one of the questions, I think he made a comment that uh, it was not correctly formulated. So, so he questioned the question of the bar exam. And he failed. Of course, of course he, he failed because uh, I mean, the, the examiner was uh, probably insulted, you know. So he was given a, he was, he, he did not fail because, you know, uh, uh, he was uh, uh, not knowledgeable of the law, but probably he failed because he got a, a, uh, a dis disqualification, uh, di disqualifying grade, you know, because in the bar exams, even if you, you know, your average is, uh, is uh, above 90, for instance, but if in one subject, just in one subject, you get a score of less than 50, then you are disqualified. So probably he, he got disqualified in that subject where he questioned, you know, the question of the examiner. So, so uh, it's the same, you know, in, in the, the foreign service exam, sometimes you, you know, you will uh, encounter tricky questions, but you have to answer. You know? You have to answer it in a rational manner, of course, uh, not not insulting, no? not insulting the examiner. Otherwise, you will fail. And uh, you know, in in uh, in uh, the foreign service exam, you really have to be you know uh, knowledgeable in history, in geography, in current you know current events. International politics, international economics, and uh, you must at least know one foreign language besides English. Now, of course, English for us is not uh, really foreign, but uh, you have to, you know, be proficient in another uh, foreign language. So uh, the easiest, of course, is uh, Spanish because uh, that's the closest that uh, you know. And uh, for, for us, uh, Filipinos, uh, it's easy to learn Spanish because we, we already have a lot of uh, Spanish words in our vocabulary. Thank 
you so much, Mr. Ambassador. So here's a follow-up question from that same person, Mr. Ambassador. So upon reading your biography in several sources online, you have been into several positions and throughout the years, the government has entrusted vital tasks to you. What experience can you share to us that you consider the most memorable so far as a diplomat? Uh, there's so many. And, uh, you know, in, in, in uh, our uh, work in the DFA, uh, we do also administrative work. We do consular work. Uh, when it comes to, uh, to uh, uh, consular work, probably uh, the memorable, most memorable for me is, you know, when I was uh, assigned uh, in Jakarta, uh, Indonesia, you know, wherein we were, uh, we had a very difficult case, you know, at the time that involved uh, uh, Filipinos who were, uh, uh, involved in a so-called mining, you know, mining uh, hoax or scam. And it really affected the, you know, it, 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 uh, the, the, uh, the issue was not just confined to Indonesia, but uh, was, was affected uh, uh, other countries, especially Canada. Uh, it was very difficult. Uh, uh, but uh, we, we well, uh, one of the one of the uh, incidents that was uh, you know uh, that was uh, uh, after uh, the, the aftermath of, of uh, that uh, controversy you know because because you know it the Filipino uh, the Filipino uh, uh, what do you call this uh, mining uh, engineer the head of the mining operations in Indonesia at the time committed, well, he allegedly committed suicide. No? He allegedly committed suicide after, uh, you know, the, the uh, hoax was uh, discovered no? when, when there was a, an audit uh, made on the mining operations and the hoax was about to be discovered. He allegedly committed suicide. No? So, uh, and there were other Filipinos, no? his companions uh, in the mining area, and they were they were held hostage by the natives, no? because the natives, when when uh, when uh, the controversy uh, you know uh, erupted, you know the 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 mine had to be closed, and the natives, you know, because uh, you know they would uh, you know they would become uh, jobless. Of course, they were demanding, you know, uh, separation pay and all these uh, other, you know, benefits, you know. And so uh, they held, you know, the Filipinos uh, who were there hostage, you know, so that they will be their their demands would be met. So we had to uh, to uh, conduct a well. An operation. <laughs> no. We we had to extract them. You know, we had to extract them from from the you know from the place, and uh, we did it uh, you know in cooperation with the Indonesian police. So we had to uh, try to uh, convince you know the natives to bring them to to the capital, the provincial capital in Samarinda. And uh, our consul general in Manado was there. He was a former uh, officer of the military. And uh, he was there, he was uh, reporting to us that well, uh, the, the uh, situation was very tense, you know, because uh, there were truckloads of natives, you know, bearing, uh, you know, spears and <laughs> machetes. You know. So uh, we we uh, managed to uh, you know to uh, extract them when uh, the police uh, sent an order for them to be transferred from Samarinda to the regional capital in Balikpapan you know Balikpapan so it was 
quite far from their from their home from their home place. That's why very, just very few of them were able to follow you know, uh, to follow to Balikpapan. So when the police saw that uh, you know the crowd was already manageable, that's how they you know they managed to uh, you know to extract them and send them to Jakarta. And uh, eventually, we immediately repatriated them to the Philippines without delay. Yeah. So uh, that was a very difficult case. And uh, another case was uh, also in Indonesia. The, we had a Filipina uh, who was accused of, uh, of uh, assisting in an abortion in Saudi Arabia. So the Filipina was an OFW in Saudi Arabia, but uh, she was uh, accused of assisting in an abortion, which entails a death penalty. So uh, I was tasked to uh, persuade, you know, the the family in Indonesia because the 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 worker who died, you know, was her companion, uh, also an OFW, but Indonesian. No, the 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 uh, the Indonesian was the one who died, you know, who had an abortion and uh, died in the process. No? So uh, I was tasked to uh, obtain, you know, the the forgiveness, the affidavit of forgiveness, no? and also to uh, to pay the of course with the affidavit of forgiveness you have to pay blood money. We had to pay blood money. So we had to, uh, you know, search for the family, especially the husband, you know, uh, in one of the villages in, in uh, East Java at the time. And uh, we managed to convince, you know, we managed to convince uh, the husband to execute an affidavit of forgiveness you know, and uh, to accept the, the blood money. But at the time, it was a small amount. No? We, we paid only 1,500 US dollars. But uh, in Indonesian money, rupiah, it's a substantial amount. No? Million. <laughs> it would be more than a million uh, rupiahs. But the problem was that, uh, you know, uh, it coincided with the case of Sara Balabagan, you know, you know that uh, famous, uh, you know, uh, OFW, who was also spared the death penalty, you know, for for uh, the killing of uh, her employer, who who tried to rape her. So, uh, in the case of Sara Balabagan, I think the the uh, Philippines, through the Philippine government and some you know, uh, well-meaning uh, Filipinos, you know, businessmen, who contributed, uh, you know. Uh, uh, to the blood money. Uh, I think we paid something like more than 50,000 US dollars uh, as blood money. So uh, when we already had the, <laughs> the affidavit of uh, the, the uh, what do you call this, the, uh, the husband, uh, affidavit of forgiveness uh, in Indonesia. So we went to the uh, uh, Saudi uh, embassy to have it authenticated, you know, to have the document authenticated so that it can be used uh, at the court in Saudi Arabia. Now the, the, uh, the Saudi consul wanted us to bring the husband personally, physically before the consul. You know before he would authenticate. Now, the uh, Sarah Balabagan case came up in the papers, no? in the headlines of the, the newspapers in Indonesia. And uh, it was stated there, of course, that we paid you know, more than 50,000 US dollars. And you know, the, the Indonesian you know, husband, we only paid him 1,500 US dollars. So when we tried to uh, get the Indonesian you know, spouse to go to Jakarta, he refused. 
he refused. And, uh, you know, he was demanding through the lawyer, through his lawyer, he was already demanding uh, 15,000 US dollars. So it was a big headache for me, you know, because uh, we didn't have the, uh, the money at the time. And uh, at the time, we didn't have uh, uh, assistance to national fund. You know? uh, we, we had, but uh, very, very you know, minimal. I think uh, each embassy at the time was just given uh, uh, 3,000 US dollars, a standby fund you know, uh, for assistance to nationals. So you could just imagine. You know? So that's why I had, we had to you know, devise you know, uh, based on our knowledge of uh, you know, inter, uh, international practice, international diplomatic practice. So I inquired from, the, you know, from our uh, embassy in Riyadh, you know, who was handling the case at the time. So uh, we cannot get, I told them we cannot have it authenticated by the Saudi you know, uh, consul here. So uh, we asked our embassy if uh, alternatively, you know, the document will be, you know, uh, will be recognized by, by the Saudi court if it was authenticated by, this, by the Indonesian consul in Riyadh. You know? Because uh, that's how you know authentications are 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 done. You know, it's either uh, the Saudi uh, consul in Jakarta authenticates it, and it can be used in in uh, in uh, a Saudi court, or uh, with the proper uh, authentication procedures, it can also be authenticated by the Indonesian uh, Department of Foreign Affairs and the Indonesian Embassy in Riyadh. You know? So. When uh, I got the affirmative answer, then that's what we did. It was easier for me to approach the Indonesian foreign, foreign uh, ministry, you know, to get an authentication of the document and uh, have the document also authenticated by the Indonesian embassy in Riyadh. So that's how we were able to, you know, to circumvent, you know, the, well, not really circumvent because that's that's really the actual uh, diplomatic practice, you know, of authenticating documents. So uh, that's how we solved re we resolved the problem, and uh, fortunately, the Filipina was spared, you know, the death penalty because of that. Uh, other uh, there were so many other, uh, you know, uh, cases. Well, probably in uh, in uh, negotiations, yeah. in in negotiations like uh, in the U in the UN uh, in in Geneva, you know, uh, I had to you know I had to uh, to face uh, even uh, ambassadors. I say I was I was just a junior officer at the time, but uh, I had to engage in uh, debate or argument with you know <laughs> even ambassadors. No? So just to try to protect uh, Philippine, you know, Philippine interests, like in the field of uh, disarmament, you know, uh, when when uh, a country tried to introduce a uh, an instrument that would regulate, you know, uh, small caliber weapons, and at the time it would have affected, you know, the the M16 rifle, which is the standard rifle, the standard weapon of our armed forces. So I, I uh, refused and uh, I uh, objected to the, the, the introduction, you know, or even the discussion of that, uh, that uh, instrument. And uh, eventually I got the support of other countries like the US and India and, but uh, I also managed to contribute something, you know, like, uh, uh, in the same forum, I I, uh, uh, I introduced uh, you know compromise language, for instance, uh, in the scope of the uh, the scope of the uh, convention on uh, certain conventional weapons. So that that uh, the the convention, the amended scope would now uh, include non-state actors. So at the time, uh, you know, India, the India because of uh, Kashmir and uh, Russia, 
because of Chechnya at the time, uh, they refused. No? They refused to have the scope amended to include the non-state actors. No? And of course, for us initially, we refused because you know of the uh, MNL, uh, the MILF uh, problem at the time in the south. So eventually, uh, because of uh, pressure, and because I already, you know, I already. Uh, uh, sidelined one important uh, you know instrument that was to be approved during that meeting so i uh, came up with the compromise language that yeah okay we, we will agree provided that you know uh, uh, we will not you know the the inclusion of these non-state actors will not entail uh, the legal recognition of uh, status of belligerency so it does not, you know, uh, entail the recognition, you know, their their belligerent status. Because uh, once you are, uh, you know, you in international law, if uh, you are uh, given a belligerent status, you have certain, you know, uh, you 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 uh, uh, you are. Uh, uh, you have an international status no? as, as a, an entity under international law. So belligerent status may, may uh, under international humanitarian law, you have ob certain obligations to, to, uh, to observe. No? And in the same, same manner that uh, your, your uh, combatants you know, as a belligerent uh, will be accorded the same status. No? like uh, status as prisoners of war, for instance. So they have to be respected you know, by, by, the, uh, by, by the state. So that's why uh, many countries do not want uh, to give uh, you know, this uh, insurgents or yeah, the, the insurgents uh, belligerent status. Thank you for that, Mr. Ambassador. So there's a question also coming from uh, Mr. Rodolfo De La Torre, a first year political science student, Mr. Ambassador. His question is, with the differences of languages as the representative of our country, how to maintain trust of the government of the countries or country that you are designated with? Uh, pardon? Well, well, well. Can you can you repeat the question? It's, For it's sure. Not, yeah, not quite clear. Okay, Mr. Ambassador. So the question is: With the differences of languages, as the representative of our country, how to maintain trust of the government of the countries or country that you are designated with? Uh, the differences of languages. Well. Uh, in in uh, modern uh, diplomacy now uh, english is is the common you know or what you call the default uh, language so uh, uh, naturally you can communicate anywhere in the world you will be able to communicate uh, in in english and even in the united nations uh, whenever uh, the uh, services of translators cannot be availed of, then the default language is always English. Uh, although uh, in major meetings, all the major languages will be, you know, uh, you, you, will, you can avail of uh, translation services uh, in major meetings. So all the seven uh, languages. So, uh, even in uh, the conclusion of uh, treaties and agreements, you know, uh, they they always uh, you know uh, are done in uh, in uh, the language in English, you know, English, and the the uh, uh, language of the the other country. Uh, for for instance, in our case, like if if we uh, if we uh, conclude an agreement with China. There's always the English version of the, of the agreement and the Chinese uh, version. And uh, 
there's always a provision that both texts are equally authentic. So equally authentic. So it's always like that. Well, in the Philippines, sometimes we uh, we can introduce our own uh, Philippine uh, Filipino. But uh, since uh, we are already uh, used to, you know, to English, and uh, besides, uh, uh, there are terms that are difficult to <laughs> translate in in Filipino. That's why that's why uh, uh, we prefer to uh, have our text in English, you know, even if we have our own uh, Filipino language. Thank you, sir. So there's one more question, sir, coming from Mr. Dominic Baldon. So his question is, is there such thing as a hierarchy on the foreign policies where a certain foreign policy is considered a top priority compared to other foreign policies? And if there is, upon whose discretion and order shall it come from? Well, uh, foreign policy, as I have mentioned earlier, is set by our political leaders now. So uh, actually, uh, as I've said, it's an extension of domestic policy. And what is domestic policy? It's just the summation of our values, aspirations as a nation, as a people. Uh, it is expressed or manifested in our laws, no? uh, primarily in our laws no? and uh, legal issuances. So, uh, and the chief uh, architect of uh, Philippine foreign policy is the president, no? uh, because we we uh, adopt the so-called Jeffersonian uh, doctrine, no? uh, when the executive is the the uh, chief architect of uh, foreign policy. Although, of course, uh, other uh, institutions like uh, Congress can also, you know. Uh, initiate uh, foreign policy. And as I've said, when they pass laws, you know. Uh, so that's why that's why uh, uh, foreign policy uh, nowadays is is really a, a very broad, you know, uh, concept. So it's not just uh, uh, an exclusive now the exclusive domain of. Uh, the Department of Foreign Affairs, although we are the uh, chief, you know, instruments you know, of the government in implementing foreign policy, because of our, you know, of our uh, status you know, of uh, being diplomats and uh, and stationed abroad. You know. But other institutions like uh, Congress and uh, even the judiciary, they can, you know, in their own uh, way, uh, also be, you know, be uh, exercising foreign policy. Like uh, nowadays, uh, we have uh, interparliamentary, you know, uh, interparliamentary exchanges. You know, we have the IPU, for instance, the Interparliamentary Union, which is a an international, uh, you know, organization of parliamentarians. You know, and. Uh, in, in their uh, meetings and discussions, they also deal with, you know, with international issues like human rights, you know, the human rights of parliamentarians, of course, uh, sometimes uh, to, be, to be specific. And, uh, and even, even the, the Supreme Court, they, they also, you know, uh, engage in, you know, in, uh, especially in the formation of, uh, or formulation of uh, international instruments. You know. So that's it. Thank you so much, Mr. Ambassador, for imparting your knowledge to us about foreign policies. So as much as we wanted to ask more questions, we don't have much time. So maybe we can ask uh, Mr. Ambassador for his final message for those students who are aspiring to become diplomats someday. Well, I really would like to encourage uh our students, no? especially those taking uh, political science, although it's not, it's not uh, exclusive, you know. I mean, uh, anyone, any uh, graduate of any uh, uh, college degree 
are uh, qualified no, to take the foreign service exam. We have uh, uh, officers who are nurses or fisheries graduate, architects. So we, we, we have, uh, you know, uh, all sorts of, uh, you know, people in, in, uh, in the foreign service. Uh, although uh, many, of course, are, are lawyers. No? Well, uh, some of them, uh, they, they, uh, they gain their expertise in a particular field uh, while they're already in the service, you know, uh, because we, we afford, uh, you know, scholarships to our, you know, to our officers. You know? We can, we sometimes send them to Cambridge, to uh, Oxford, to Johns, Johns Hopkins, uh, Georgetown universities. So, uh, but then uh, uh, getting in is the major hurdle. You know? And uh, getting in means passing the foreign service uh, officer's exam. And uh, it's, it's, it's no joke you know, to pre prepare for this exam as uh, mentioned by uh, one, one uh, of those who propounded the question. You know? uh, that's why you really have to study hard. You know? I already uh, enumerated the various subjects that you, you should you know, uh, focus on. History, especially world history, uh, international politics, international economics, uh, current events. Of course, uh, Philippine, uh, you know, Philippine conditions, Philippine culture, and Philippine history. Uh, it's also very important because uh, you know if if you're lacking you know in in Philippine history, uh, how how are you supposed to represent you know the country uh, effectively you know, abroad if uh, you don't even know your own history and culture? Yeah. So uh, these are the uh, the things that uh, that you should really focus on and prepare you know, uh, if you wish to take the foreign service officer's exam. And I really would uh, encourage uh, our students to, uh, to make it a try, to give it a try, you know, to give it a try. Because uh, right now we have uh, uh, a few Boholanos. You know? I'm the most senior of uh, the Boholano diplomats at this time, but we have a few uh, Boholanos. Uh, uh, we have Raymond Toledo, the son of uh, uh, the late commissioner, Tami Toledo. Uh, we have uh, uh, Melihor, Mer Mersole Melihor, who is now, uh, you know, the, the uh, officer in charge of our personnel, you know, the human resources uh, office of the DFA. And uh, we have uh, Alexander Istomo, whose parents hail from Panglao, Bohol. Uh, Mersole Melihor is from Katigbian. Uh, and then uh, recently we have a new passer, uh, Abigail Mioli, whose uh, father is a good friend of mine from Gindulman, Gindulman Bohol. So uh, we have quite a number of Boholanos. You know? And uh, I, but then I would really encourage uh, more, uh, more uh, Boholanos to really uh, give it a, a try. And uh, probably I'm, I'm uh, the only one from, uh, Divine Word you know, uh, or, or uh, HNU, except for uh, Black Suarez. I think uh, uh, Ambassador Suarez uh, at one point, uh, you know, attended also uh, Holy Name, Holy Name uh, School before. You know. But uh, in my case, I really uh, spent a lot of time. You know. uh, in fact, I, I graduated in uh, Holy Name University, uh, formerly Divine Word College of Tagbilaran. And uh, I really uh, take pride of my being a, uh, a Promdi, Promdi, from, from the province, you know, straight from the province, because mo most of, you know, even the Boholanos that are now in the service, uh, they're from UP, you know, they're from the University of the Philippines. Uh, Ray Toledo, uh, Melihor, and uh, Miole, they, they are graduates of the University of the Philippines in uh, Diliman. So I'm the only uh, uh, Boholano and graduate of uh, Holy Name uh, University. In fact, when I joined this service for the first time, the DFA, 
1981. And they, when they, my, my colleagues, office colleagues asked me uh, where I graduated. And I said, uh, Divine World College of Tagbilaran. Where is that? You know, <laughs> you know you gonna, where is that? Or do you have a school, you know, in, in, in Bohol? Something like that, you know, do you have a college there? That's why I told them, of course. And, I, and then I, I even uh, told them that, don't you know that our school is the only school outside of Manila that produced a Bartap Natsar? At the time, we had uh, Oscar Globasa you know, as a Bartap Natsar. So that's why uh, they would be amazed. Oh, is that so? But then, uh, of course, when you are there, uh, you have to you know, make a mark for yourself. Uh, make a mark for yourself. Hindi yung papasok ka lang and then wala na. You will you will just uh, you know bide your time until you become an ambassador. No, no. you have to you know contribute something. You know. No matter how small, you have to contribute something for the country. Okay, thank you once again, His Excellency Simapanka. Thank you, Krista. It has been a great share. In this phase, may we present and give the certificate of appreciation to our guest speaker, Professor Opus. Please do the honor. Yes, uh, once again, Ambassador, thank you so much for this, sharing your invaluable time. We know you're very busy, but now we know truly you, how, how proud you are to be a member of the Holy Name or Divine Word College family. So, salamat yun kaayo. So, without much ado, may I present this virtual certificate? Can we have it, Crystal? As a sign or a gesture of our appreciation, we'd like to give this certificate of appreciation to... Can we have it, please? We would have wanted more time. Actually, we have a lot of uh, questions still, Ambassador. But you know, we, we know you're a very busy person. So probably next time, I'm quite sure this is yes, not going to be the only sure. time. <laughs> Anytime. Yeah. Anytime. Okay, yeah, yeah. Because this class actually is hoping to have as its uh, final activity, a forum with at least four guests from all over the world. We are hoping to do that. So. Your, your, you know, your presence. Maybe, maybe we can invite again. the other uh, Boholano diplomats, you know, right, in one. Right. Yes. So, so that they can also uh, uh, narrate Share. their right, own right, right. <laughs> right, yeah. So anyway, this is our certificate to of appreciation to, to His Excellency Frank Arsima Franca for sharing his available time with us. Uh, for this activity, Unity and Diversity, uh, sponsored by the Paul Sci 107 class and, of course, the Association of Political Science Majors in Holy Name University. This is signed by Milvan Ausa, the president of the organization. Yours truly, the professor of this class and the chair of uh, the Political Science Department. And, of course, from the dean of the College of Arts and Sciences, doc Dr. Ramon a. Boloran. Thank you so much, Ambassador you, Frank. Sema Franca. Okay. okay. Milvan, Milvan Ausa is. Uh, Milvan how Ausa. Is he, how is he related to, to uh, Bart Ausa? Uh, Milvan. Milvan, you're still there? Yes. Uh, yes. Are you related <laughs> to uh, uh, Bart Ausa, the, my former uh, professor uh, before in uh, ethics, I think? I, um, I really yeah. don't know that. I, to be honest, I really don't. But I don't know. Kisama, kisama, taga kan ka, taga Talibon ka ba? Talibon, Talibon, Talibon. Yeah. Talibon. Oh, related to kan, to uh, our Papal Nuncio in kan, uh, si Archbishop uh, Barney Ausa, Bernardito Ausa. You're related but, to. Him? Um. Yes, sir. Kan, igalaw niya sa mga papa. Uh, okay. <laughs> Okay. Well, he's also one of the top uh, Boholano uh, diplomats because, uh, but in the service of the Holy See, Vatican, ambassador ng Vatican to the uh, to Madrid, Spain. Yeah. 
Maybe you should also invite him. Probably you yeah, can invite soon. him. Yeah, soon. Yes, we will. Future, yeah. Yes, Pohon, Pohon, yes, we will. <laughs> okay, Alexis. Okay. okay, once again, thank you, thank you, His Excellency, for being with us today. And at this juncture, may I request everyone to turn on their cameras for our photo up. May I request the participants to show their beautiful and handsome faces, including everyone that has joined us today. Okay. Alexis. Yes, ma'am. The, the message of our dean, please. Oh, I think he Okay. Yeah. At this point, may I request our beloved Dean, Dr. Ramon Buloron, for his closing message? Sir, you may take the floor. Thank you very much. Uh, Ivan, am I correct? Hi, Alexis. Sorry. Hi, Alexis. Alexis. Thank you very much, Alexis. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Kit. Okay, my dear students and faculty, both in the graduate and undergraduate uh, levels, I think our SBD fathers are still around. And of course, our honored guests, good afternoon. Let me recall the inspiring words of the US President Theodore Roosevelt, who said, far better it is to, to dare mighty things to win glorious triumph, even though checkered by failure, than to remain with those poor spirit who neither enjoy much nor suffer much because they lived in the great twilight that knows not victory nor defeat. We have too much to do to sit on the sidelines. We need to step you out of the great twilight into the bright sunshine so that we can all see the dawn of a new day, end quote. The words of U.S. President Theodore Roosevelt are true and are still relevant today because we have with us our dear students who are enrolled in the course International Relations with Dr. Kit Upus. And I'm sure the students might follow the footsteps of Ambassador Sima Franca. This student's dream for peace, international cooperation, unity among countries amidst diversity through diplomacy or diplomatic service. The topic diplomacy or diplomatic service chosen for the special lecture clearly expresses the challenges we are facing. I think you would agree with me if I say that the world today has shown very clearly the importance of international relations. As pointed out by Ambassador Sima Franca, the foremost challenge we're facing is conflict between the Philippines and China over South China Sea. The topic on diplomatic relations is appropriate because an international crisis is on our doorstep in our immediate environment. And as students of international relations, you will agree with me if I say that international relations plays a key role in solving this global crisis. I am glad that the lecture or this seminar on international relation and the interaction that followed this afternoon turned out to be very informative, interesting, and engaging. At the end, let me say, I am glad to join you all today and for the first time to listen to the lecture of our distinguished ambassador, Frank Jojo Simafranca, an ambassador to Hungary who is truly Bohol's pride and a true blue Polynesian. I want to thank him for sharing his brilliant ideas with our students, faculty, and friends of Holy Name University. I am also extremely proud of Dr. Anne-Marie Kitupus for organizing this special lecture or this seminar, so to speak. I want to thank her and her team for the excellent work. I would like also to thank Ms. Vera Vilius Sido for featuring this event in one of the episodes of In Focus of Holy Name University. And to all the participants, thank you for being part of this event. Daghan kaayong salamat. 
Okay, thank you for that, Dr. Bloron. Now, may I request everyone to open their cameras for us to have a picture of the participants. Together with His Excellency, the deans, faculty, and staff of Holy Name University. Remove. Okay, thank you, thank you, everyone. To officially close this event, may I live with what Eleanor Roosevelt once said? It isn't enough to talk about peace. One must believe in it. It isn't enough to believe in it. One must work at it. So even, at, so even if the lights go out, we got to keep seeing the colors. We have to throw ourselves wide open, set our sights ready for everyday life. Once again, this, is, this has been Chester, a first year political science student saying, it has been a pleasure until next time. More power, h &E Political Science Program. More power, College of Arts and Science. And more power, Holy Name University. More power. Thank you, Kai. Thank you, Kaayo. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Roosevelt. Thank you, Dr. Roosevelt. Thank you, Dr. Roosevelt. Thank you, Dr. Roosevelt. Also saying that uh, in diplomacy, you have to speak gently, but carry a big stick. Yeah. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you everyone. It's one of the oldest and premier programs offered at Holy Name University since its inception. It has produced a number of notable public and civil servants, lawyers, judges, media personalities, businessmen, and public administrators who have been successful in their fields of endeavor exhibiting excellence as enshrined in the school's mission. all the latest mandatory courses from the Commission on Higher Education with additional major and elective subjects that will prepare the students for advanced legal studies, public administration, legislation, plus local and international development work. The BA Political Science is a Level 4 PASCO accredited program of Holy Name University, the only CHED Autonomous University in the province of Bohol. Once again, thank you, His Excellency Sima Franca. Thank you, thank you, everyone. Thank you, Mankit. Thank you, thank you. Thank you. Good job, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Mangayo ako sa video ato ha. Ano mi sa nani Eman ma? Wait, no, si ma'am. What's the email niya? Ma oh, ma ma Bvilucido at hnu.edu.ph Wait, where? Okay, na. Sana ito yung na-host, Ani? Ano na yung mukha, ha? Si Eman, ma'am. Ah, ako, ibalin niyo, ma'am. Ayun na. Ah, so, sige. Pagpabihin sa mo. Ayun, ah, pabutog 24 hours. Ah, <laughs> sige, ma'am. <laughs> Okay, thank you, ma'am. 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 Thank you, ma
Thank, Thank you, you, Mom. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.